The word says, for the spirit of heaviness, put on the garment of praise. And that's how we fight our battles. Yeah. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I find my battles. What we're doing tonight. This is how I find my battles. This is when you think you're lost. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Welcome to Dr. Deep State. Today we have a very special guest. Dr. E. Michael Jones is with us, the highly influential author. And I'd like to begin our session today before I introduce uh, Will Tucker and Boyd Kinsey. I would like to do, uh, ask for everybody's patience. I would like to do a brief survey of the landscape that we're about to get into today. I think uh, a lot of the events that went on last week are fortuitous. Um, they meet both with um, Dr. Jones's former work and the work that he's about to do. So we'd like to hit on some of that stuff. So in the largest sense, we would like to go over affairs in the world, affairs in the church, and the theology that both unites and divides those. And by theology, um, my conversion into Catholicism happened through God's grace. My eyes were open that uh, the Catholic Church was the church started by Christ. Um, it, was, it is his visible mystical body that superseded the old covenant and forged the new. It is the unique mechanism by which man and all of creation will be redeemed. So these remain fundamental truths, even in the post-conciliar church. And I would invite people to look at the link below provided ADL and the Jews about Catholicism. Some of these lies that are highlighted are that because of recent uh, dialogues, interfaith dialogues, that Catholics no longer believe that this is the supersessionist church, that is replacement theology essentially, and that, that Catholics no longer believe that this is the one unique covenant. 
So um, the, this brings us over to uh, Dr. Jones. Now in preparing this, I was wanting to find out what Dr. Jones' new book was. So when you type in E. Michael Jones and uh, Culture Wars, what comes up is a number, it's almost difficult to find the site, the number of ADL sites. In one uh, entry, he's described as a traditional Catholic and another just a Catholic. This might be pl plausible deniability. I'll ask Dr. Jones in just a moment how he self-identifies, whether or not this is accurate or not. But when we read on, we find E. Michael Jones uh, lumped in with, um, with Bishop Williamson, with Kevin McDonald, with Michael Hoffman. So there's sort of this net. These, um, these claims by the ALL, they say that anybody that still holds to these traditional beliefs or these dogmas of the church, supersessionism and no faith, no uh, salvation outside of the church, the only Catholics, according to the ADL, that they've sussed because of their interfaith dialogue, the only people that still hold to these are far right-wing, anti-Semitic, conspiracy-minded individuals, such as the ones just mentioned. Which brings us into the current community of Catholic traditional influencers, who I think have heard the message and understand the algorithms and will not touch those authors and this debate, which are core claims of Catholicism. That is the one unique church, one covenant alone. There's not multiple covenants. And this is also very significant because of the law of non-contradiction, something both can't be and not be. And I believe this is the space that a lot of uh, traditional Catholic influencers as a network are trying to tread in between these phase, uh, phases, and it's very problematic. I believe it's problem of omission, which essentially makes them a type of gatekeeper. And uh, even we could say beyond being a gatekeeper, they operate as a type of, sorry, <laughs> limited hangout. And uh, that's kind of harsh language, but when you really get down to it and push it, that's what it's become. So um, being sort of cuckold in this sense uh, by the ADL and kind of hamstrung here, who they do go for, for information on the schisms in the church are people, the likes of Ben Shapiro, who has taken on the role of defining the Judeo-Christian role of the schism. He seems to operate as a epistemic community for the coming schism in the church. Now, this brings us to a more interesting point, which is what's broken out this week with Elon Musk and the lawsuit. Um, there's, there's information out there that the ADL is, in, this is radical, that they're inside people's homes looking for hate speech. And it's to the point where anybody stands up for the core doctrines of the Catholic Church can be accused of hate speech, never mind the fact that all this deals with real legal situations like slander and libel. So this is where we're kind of treading in the breakthrough this week. And I think Dr. Jones is going to have some great insights into this. But the um, we got now, um, maybe some of this with Musk as AstroTurf, but the grassroots element seems to be very big, this momentum that's building up, ban the ADL. There's actually an open conversation about this right now so that people like Shapiro and Miller are coming out and saying, well, the ADL says a couple good things like the Zionist things, but essentially that's a Democrat thing. That's a left wing thing. So they're divorcing themselves. Meanwhile, in the twilight zone, people like Alex Jones saying this is a Hitler Nazi organization that pretends to be Jewish or an associate. You can't even decipher what that's about. Our claim here is that the Catholic claim of the supersessionist church is fundamental to the millennial reign, the two where the saints are, which have been under attack since the Reformation. So together, our ability to hold to these dogmatic truths, I think, are a restraining advice, a restraining advice, a restraining device involving the Holy Spirit. And unless we can get out of this law of non-contradiction and stand for these fundamental truths, this gate of, of, of the church, um, this is really blocking the gates of hell from coming upon us. And so the critical piece of this is the influencers, the traditional influencers that should be preserving this, the salt 
uh, on these claims of Catholicism are really wavering and it's problematic. And I think we may, depending on where Dr. Jones wants to go into this, introduce another problem in the church, which is one individual that's coming in with his prophecies and his typologies that has a lot of baggage dealing with um, dual covenant theology. He has been embraced by this traditional community. And I think it's a problem that needs to be highlighted. I'm sorry for that long introduction. Dr. Jones, you can pick up any place you like with the excitement this week, Elon Musk. And if you care to kind of address, do you even self-identify as, uh, just do, you, do you self-identify as a devout Catholic, a Catholic? Are you okay with the traditional Catholic um, uh, label on yourself? Good. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I'd like to uh, kind of state my position uh, as a rower on the St. Joe River. Uh, I row on a regular basis in a very narrow boat. It's a racing shell. It's maybe about 18 inches wide at its widest. And uh, I am competing with uh, bass boats that have 250 horsepower engines uh, that have to race. There's only a mile and a half you can go from the boat ramp and they have to race by you. And what happens is that uh, they create a wake and you just start bouncing up and down. I think that's the metaphor for uh, my position in the intellectual world as well. You have these big uh, boats like the ADL that go by and then they just cause a wake and there's turbulence and it's hard to keep concentrating. You know, it's hard to row in a situation like that and get forward to where you want to go. Um, now, to get back to the sp uh, a more specific issue, uh, I just got Bob Genesis' latest book, uh, which is about the whole history of what happened here with supersessionism. Uh, this story began at Culture Wars. It's the magazine that we edit when Bob St. Genis wrote an article, and I believe it was 2009, in which he said that the 2006 Catholic catechism was heretical. And it had a heretical statement in it. And the heretical statement was basically that the Mosaic Covenant is eternally valid. That was a statement of the United States Catholic bishops and it turns out that the bishops were surprised to learn about this. So after the article came out, there was a, a consternation, and the bishops themselves voted to take that statement out. Now, we have to make a distinction here, but because we're talking about the Catholic Church, of the actual Catholic Church, the actual bishops who are the successors of the apostles and the people they hire basically to do their work for them. Uh, that's called the United States Catholic Conference as opposed to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So at this point, the bishops say this statement must be removed. Now, this is 19, 2009. They have published an enormous number of these catechisms that have gone out. You know, hundreds of thousands of these catechisms have gone out. And the bureaucrats at this point, the USCC, the, the CCB, uh, say, yes, we'll do that. Yes. You can count on us. Now, these are bureaucrats. They're not bishops. And what happens is for 10 years, nothing gets done. Nothing. Absolutely nothing got done. Now, this is the way these people take control of the church. And if you're talking about someone like the notorious uh, head of Catholic Jewish dialogue, Eugene Fisher, what you have is a man who is working for the Jews to influence the Catholic bishops. That is always going to be the strongest force field because when that bass boat goes by at 50 miles an hour, it disrupts everything. And the people running that bass boat are the ADL, the Jewish organizations that have been engaging in this uh, mendacious dialogue with the Catholic Church for years now. So what happens? 2019, they bring out a new translation and they start quoting St. Paul in a completely mendacious way. Uh, about the gifts belong. The word belong, as Bob Sugenis points out, goes back to the original Greek, is not in the original Greek. It's of, it's a kind of uh, a subordinate clause. The, the, and he, it says the Israelites, 
That's the word that is used. So what happens here? They translate Israelites as the Jewish people. No, that's not true. What happens when you turn it into the Jewish people? Well, I guess it means uh, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, right? He's the one who received the promise, right? This is all of the things that St. Paul is talking about. To Jonathan Greenblatt belong the promise and the covenant and all this other. It's worse than the first statement because it has the aura of respectability because you're quoting St. Paul in a completely mendacious way. Now, that fact, the, the hijacking of the office of bishops by bureaucrats at the USCCB, whatever, whatever I, USCC, I'm sorry, I confuse these things, is the main fact that we have to deal with now. This is important because it saves the Catholic Church, it saves the magisterium of the Catholic Church because only the bishops are allowed to exercise this magisterium. And what we have is clear evidence now with this passage of malfeasance on the part of bureaucrats who I could name, uh, but let's just talk about Eugene Fisher, the, the man who was in charge of Catholic Jewish dialogue for years uh, and basically sold the farm, gave away the farm on this type of thing. That's the fundamental fact that we have to deal with. So I come into the picture. That was right around the time I was going to bring out the Jewish revolutionary spirit. The book, which I think allowed people to talk about the Jewish question in a way that uh, was uh, uh, accurate, uh, that was consonant with church tradition, and was not based on racial categories like anti-Semitism. The Jews have been upset with that ever since. I have been number one, public enemy number one, but with both the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center, and the ADL now for going on 15 years, ever since that book came out, because they cannot answer that book. They cannot. If they've had 15 years to point out the errors and there's not one thing they have pointed out, instead they engage in identity theft, and try and tell, uh, call me something that I am not, which is to say a racist. Okay, in the beginning, the ADL profile said uh, E. Michael Jones is not a racist. He's and well, if I'm not a racist, then you can't accuse me of anti-Semitism, because anti-Semitism is a racial uh, concept. Came into big into being 1871, Wilhelm Marr in Germany. Okay, before that, but so they said, but he's anti-Jewish. Well, uh, I have to plead guilty to that because the entire gospel is anti-Jewish. The gospel of St. John is anti-Jewish. The entire early church was anti-Jewish because you had this battle between the Jews who accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Jews who crucified him. That's never going to go away. And so just recently, they tried to pin the whole racial thing on me again with a completely mendacious, underhanded way of saying, uh, my assistant here asked me, so what is classical anti-Semitism? And I said, it's biological determinism. And they jump on and say, see, Jones is a racist. And then I called them on it. We printed, we, we uh, posted the original interview and the ADL had to back down. So this sets the stage now for what is the biggest event since the invention of the computer. Oh, let's, okay, let's back off a little bit. Since, since the passage of the Communications Decency Act of 1992, which paved the way for uh, pornography to be flooded through the internet, thanks to Bill Clinton and his cronies, which is the conflict between Elon Musk and the ADL over Twitter. Now, before, the whole point of this, uh, their campaign is to base it on identity theft and isolation. So they refer to me as some type of fringe character. Now, wait a minute. This book proves that supersessionism is the mainstream of Catholic theology ever since the crucifixion, when the Mosaic Covenant, the veil of the temple was ripped in half and the Mosaic Covenant expired. And then to, to make that absolutely uh, uh, emphatic, uh, God allowed the Romans to destroy the temple. At this point, there is no possibility of fulfilling the Mosaic Covenant because you have no temple, no priesthood, and no sacrifice. That has been the consistent teaching of the Catholic Church for 2,000 years, including Nostra Aetate, uh, Vatican II. 
That that is not an exception, and anybody who says it is just lying to you. And the point that we're seeing here is you've got a lot of uh, fifth column operatives within the bureaucracy of the Catholic Church. Their first allegiance is to the Jews. Their first allegiance is to the project of Catholic Jewish dialogue, which is how they make their money. That's why they're important. And, and the Jews determine who they're going to talk to. And anybody who would say that supersessionism is the constant teaching of the Catholic Church would automatically be excluded from this type of dialogue, which is what has happened. It was what happened to Bob St. Janus, marginalized by the bureaucracy that wants to have good standing with the Jews because they're the most powerful people in the country. Obviously, who wouldn't want to be in good favor with, with this group of people? But that changed last week. When oh, So Keith Wood, Irish guy, young guy, who starts tweeting about the ADL, uh, says about, you know, who gave these people the right to destroy your life, basically? Which is a good question. And immediately... Elon Musk jumps in. This is a Twitter feed and says the ADL has been trying to destroy me ever since I bought Twitter. And then it goes on to say that we've lost $22 billion worth of value in the, in the stock. And also that I'm planning to sue the ADL. Now this is big news because everybody knows who Elon Musk is. He's one of the most powerful people on the face of the earth. He apparently stopped the whole uh, NATO attack on the on the uh, Crimea by turning off Starlink. So we're talking about a serious uh, player here who is now uh, gone explicitly against the ADL. Okay, naming the ADL as a Jewish organization, naming the Jew, that is new. No one has ever done that before of that yeah. stature. And that has created a whole new ball game. And so once he did that, the hashtag ban the ADL became the number one trend on, on Twitter, on X, whatever it's called now. And that was a serious threat to the AD of the Jewish hegemony over discourse, because now, hey, it's not some fringe lunatic from South Bend, Indiana which is the way I've been defamed for 15 years now. It's somebody that they everybody knows who has 140 million followers, and he's naming the Jew as the source of the problem. That's, that's why this is different. So let me just go one step further and say there's a group called the Goyim Defense League. What do they do? They, they are the ones that stand up to the Jews, right? What do they do? They organize a, a demonstration in Florida where they have Nazis giving the Hitler salute uh, in response to this whole thing. That is, if, if I said, if these people are not getting paid by the ADL, they are really stupid because this is precisely the type of move that the ADL would endorse at this point. This is not normal Americans. Normal Americans who are outraged that basically this private operation has revoked the First Amendment and we don't have a government that will stand up for us against these bullies. No, they're all Nazis and, and white supremacists. No, that narrative has crashed. And not even the Goyim Defense League and all the publicity that we'll get. They can't bring it back because now we know. What are you going to say? Uh, Elon Musk is a white supremacist. This is the type of seismic change that took place last week. Excellent. I, I'm, I'm glad that you hit on all of those points. I want to, um, Will has got a couple great questions that are going to tie together, I think, some of your past works and your coming work. Um, before, yes, they seem to be operating um, from the same playbook. You'll remember this, Philadelphia 1979, James Gutman petitioning to become a Nazi uh, parade throughout uh, Philadelphia. It turns out he's Mordecai Levy. And so that same formula is, is repeated over and over again. Um, before I continue, I think nothing attests to your influence in the world more than that you are the number one target of the ADL. Uh, for me in my book, Seeing Through the Singularity, I was influenced by your um, logos. And I, there through redemption history, track uh, the enmity. And this is what I think we really got to get down to. We have to be able to verbally identify the enmity between the seed of the woman and the serpent. And I do that again in my new book, um, The Contest Between Being and Non-Being. These are all parallel ideas. Um, but your book, especially that you referenced, you dare say it. 
that is that is the fear. I think you unleash that thesis on the world. Will Tucker, please help us out stringing some of this together. Dr. Jones, I admire in your articles, like in, in Culture Warrior magazine recently, uh, Ratzinger in the Udensal, in your review of the Peter Seawald book, um, and Dr. Sue Genesis' Catholic teaching on the Jews and Judaism, how your publications avoid the typical saber rattling about Francis as the anti-Pope, and instead focus attention on Benedict XVI and his legacy on the Jewish question and his equivocations around the church doctrine of supersessionism way more heavily on the crisis in the church and the decline of Western civilization than the theater of Francis's pontificate. Um, you, you quote, to quote you in one of your articles, uh, during much of his career, Ratzinger suffered from theological schizophrenia, going from liberal to conservative and back again from one day to the next. Ratzinger, who is unwilling to admit that supersessionism is ineradicable, in, ineradicably rooted in scripture, tradition, and the church's magisterium, and therefore undeniably part of the Catholic faith. The conflation of the Udensal and supersessionism is a Jewish fantasy, which Ratzinger should have corrected since that connection has no basis in reality. So you focus on, um, in these articles, Nostra Tate as the epicenter of Vatican II's doctrinal shift toward uh, the, the Jewish question and with the inclusion of the term anti-Semitism, which you um, point to as provoking a shift in um, culture where uh, the, the, the sacral authority of the church over, um, over media publications allowed for Jewish monopolies to form. Um, you point to the, the film, The Pawnbroker and lifting of decency laws. Um, so, you know, what many call the weaponized ambiguity of Vatican II, um, I think you have more accurately portrayed in your description of the theological wunderkind of Joseph Ratzinger, who was uh, brought into the council, into the council as a kind of coup against Cardinal Ottaviani. Uh, Ratzinger was recruited to undermine the anti-modernist stance of Vatican I and the syllabus of errors, meanwhile affirming the traditional claims of the church while opening crevices for new hermeneutical interpretations. Uh, you br brilliantly refer to Ratzinger's influence over the council as he was both fireman and arsonist simultaneously. Um, so uh, I, I think, um, you know, Benedict's later work um, continues this theme around the Jewish question, um, particularly in a, the communal article that, that you reference. Uh, I think it's called um, um, A Grace and Vocation Without Remorse. Um, on uh, and it's a kind of a rejection of the adversos Judeos uh, tradition within Catholic uh, within Catholic teaching. Um, and in in this writing, he said Benedict affirms the missionary mandate is universal, with one exception: a mission to the Jews was not foreseen and not necessary because they alone, among all peoples, uh, foreknew the unknown God. For Israel, then, it was not a mission but a dialogue about whether Jesus of Nazareth was the son of God, the Logos, for whom, according to the promises made to his people, Israel, and the whole world without knowing it was waiting, taking up this dialogue anew, Benedict said, is the duty given to us at this time? So Catholic-Jewish dialogue, not mission. Um, in Robert Sugenis' uh, article in Culture Wars, he speaks of uh, Nostra Tate uh, through the lens of the hermeneutic of continuity, um, where he says that the doctrine of supersessionism has not been rejected by Nostra Tate. But um, there seems to be some, you know, am ambiguity, and you point to it with the one term anti-Semitism, how just in that one gesture, it hands over the keys to the enemies of the church to define the language of the Catholic Church for us. Um, so on this channel and in Doug's uh, book, we discuss uh, the catacomb, the restrainer, um, that which hold back, holds back the mystery of iniquity. And it seems like you gesture with um, your insights on the, uh, the changes in Nostra Tate and the anti-Semitism question and the shift that it creates in culture that with decency laws in pornography um, and uh, the, uh, the, the church's renouncement of its um, power over um, public discourse, that there is some sort of uh, lifting of the restrainer that takes place. Um, would, you, would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I would agree with what you said, except that when you said that uh, Ratzinger was appointed uh, as if someone higher than him uh, had uh, were recruiting him for the CIA or something like that. I am not saying that. If you want uh, agents, uh, that was Malachi Martin. Malachi Martin was clearly working for the Jews. 
at, at the Second Vatican Council, uh, uh, getting direct uh, payments in terms of book royalties from from the Jews, book uh, advances from the Jews. Uh, uh, if you want to talk about Dignitatis Humanae, John Courtney Murray was a, was an agent, uh, I think, an agent of the CIA through Time Magazine, which was the public uh, voice of the, the propaganda ministry for the United States <laughs> through Harry Luce. Harry Luce's chief assistant was C.D. Jackson. C.D. Jackson had a dual appointment at that time as uh, on the CIA payroll and on the Time Life payroll. C.D. Jackson began as a propagandist for the Holocaust narrative uh, when he held up two uh, shrunken heads and a pelvis ashtray uh, as the type of atrocity the Germans committed at Buchenwald. So John Courtney Murray was heavily involved with this whole CIA propaganda campaign. Uh, and I'm not saying that Ratzinger was. I'm saying if anybody appointed Ratzinger, it was Ratzinger himself who had the reputation at this point of being the, the theological wunderkind in Germany and was asked by Cardinal Frings to accompany him as a peritus down to the Second Vatican Council. That was Frings simply reacting to Ratzinger's brilliance. I know of no plot here whatsoever. And if there were ever a man who was capable of standing up to American social engineering, to Jewish vengeance of the sort of the, the Morgenthau plan exhibited or Jewish uh, uh, subversive moral subversion campaigns like pornography, it was Cardinal Frings. And the crucial moment came. Uh, I, I, I think I'm the only guy who's talked about this. Maybe it was because I my background of living in Germany for a while, but I actually looked into the background. And I'm saying you can't understand Ratzinger unless you understand the fact that he was 20 years old in 1947 when the Jew Morgenthau tried to starve Germany to death. And the main man who stood up to it was Cardinal Frings. He was, he was, he was a victim of social engineering. I don't think there's and, and and the victimhood and the aberrant behavior only increases as time goes on. So at the beginning, when he's working with Wojtyla, he says, "Yes, yeah, supersessionism is the teaching of the church. There's no way around it." And then he comes up with that article in Communio, which kind of tries to back away from that. And then there's this ca catastrophic collapse at the end of it. He's dead now. Uh, lecturing us from the grave in Che Cose Il Cristianismo, he came out in Italian, where he's having a dialogue with this Rabbi Folger from, uh, from uh, Vienna, and the rabbi has to now remind him that, yes, as a matter of fact, supersessionism is the teaching of the Catholic Church, and you used to support it. And Ratzinger is caught. It turns out that the rabbi knows more about Catholic theology than, than the Pope. This is embarrassing. And the fact that Ratzinger is trying to grovel for the favor of this rabbi is even more embarrassing. And then the rabbi has the chutzpah to bring up the Judenzal. Now, wait a minute. We know how the Jews are really good at pushing their buttons. You know what I mean? And if there's one neuralgic point in German history that makes Germans cringe, it's the Judenzau, which is basically the picture of the pig, the sow, uh, with Jews uh, riding the sow, and then there's one at the back lifting up the tail, licking the anus of the sow. The others are sucking at the sow's tits. I mean, obviously, this is not particularly complimentary for the Jews, but what's this got to do with Catholic dogma? Nothing, absolutely nothing. This is the folk, the German people's reaction to predatory Jewish behavior throughout the Middle Ages. And if you want a good example of it, go to Goethe in Dichtung and Wahrheit. Goethe says he used to walk by the entrance to the ghetto, the Judengasse in Frankfurt. And there was a picture of the Judens out. It was a warning. You're you're taking you're this is dangerous. Don't go any further here. Because if you go down that street, you'll run into Meyer Amschel Rothschild. It's the red sign outside his house, and he will lend you money, and that will enslave you. So stay out of the Judengasse. Now, Ratzinger could have said that. He knows more about German history than I do, and he completely collapses and gives this type of fawning, embarrassed uh, explanation. That That's tragic.
He's a tragic figure. He internalized the commands of his oppressors, and the legacy was basically that he imposed the Holocaust narrative on the Catholic Church, which means that my friend, uh, Sister Queen from Kenya, who is in her 30s and grew up in Kenya and is now a nun, she should bear the guilt for what happened in Germany in 1945 or something like that. This is awful. And the collapse, what happened here, the crucial moment came in 1964 when Ratzinger is there working, using Frings as his mouthpiece to throw out the Ottaviani documents and bring in something that's positive. What does he mean by positive? Well, what does he mean by negative? He says the syllabus of errors, Pius and I syllabus of errors, and the anti-modernist those of Pius X. There's a classic negative statements, and we want to get away from that. That's not, this is, an, this is a, a, what Freud would call a screen memory. What Ratzinger is talking about is we would like to get away from the guilt of the German past because we've all accepted the Jewish narrative that we're all guilty and we'll be guilty in perpetuo if forever for what happened to the Jews. A craven acceptance of the Jewish narrative and the uh, attempt to impose that Jew Jewish narrative on the Catholic Church at the very time, and I'm talking almost to the day, the same year that the Jews are now trying to break the code, break obscenity laws in Germany. And I'm talking specifically about a film called Das Schweigen in German or Silence, Tustwegen in Swedish, whatever it is, uh, by Ingr Ingmar Bergman, the great art director. This is the essence of the art film. And at that point, if it had artistic value, it redeeming artistic value, it wasn't obscene. And that's the way they, they, they slipped obscenity in. And the German court doesn't know what to do. And they collapse and they say, yes, it's obscene, but you have to allow it. Well, wait, that's crazy. That's what was happening. Frings was an ardent opponent of all of the attempts to put obscenity, to insert obscenity into German culture. And he supported the German Legion of Decency, which was called the Volkswartbund. And at this point, the younger generation became embarrassed by their own attempts to fight schmutz und schund. You take that word, say that to a German and see the reaction you get. Schmutz und schund. It's like filth and smut. They get embarrassed. It's like bringing up the Judenzau. They get embarrassed. They don't know what to say. They start to stammer. Well, that's what the problem was. And the problem was that all of those people had been brainwashed by the glossy magazines, all of which had to get licenses from a Jew by the name of David Mordecai Levy in order to be published. And they were promoting Kinsey, and Kinsey was science. And are you against science? What are you talking about, schmutz und schund? Kinsey is, this is the type of internalization of the commands of their oppressors that had tragic consequences, not only for the German people and witness the synod as the prime example of what I'm talking about, but for the whole Catholic Church as well. Excellent. Boyd, I think you might have a question, but I think what we, to pull this together, I think what's important is this concept that the core claim of the Catholic Church is that it is a supersessionist church. And if we can hold that in mind in this public discourse and perhaps this window of opportunity to speak about this, we can kind of, we, we know what needs to be preserved. Boyd, would you like to ask Dr. Jones a question? Dr. Jones, my question uh, may or may not be related, but RFK Jr. Uh, sort his hat there in the ring for uh, the presidential nomination. What in your opinion, it's the connection between Joseph Kennedy's ideology and approach to American European relationship to uh, to RFK's stance. Is there a, a connection in what has happened to his uh, progeny, or um, is there no are you, connection? You're are you are you talking about his grandfather now, I the am. ambassador to England? Yeah, I am. Well, he had a, a very uh, anti-war stance, and um, I'm interested in how that's come down through the ages. If the his son and grandson have that or not? No, the answer is no. And the answer, the answer is basically what happened. Uh, what the Joseph Kennedy was a representative of America first. 
Uh, and this was the isolationist movement that was uh, organized by the overwhelming majority of people to keep America out of the Second World War. The leaders were Charles Lindbergh, Father Coughlin, and Henry Ford, all from the Midwest. Uh, but there was a kind of Catholic connection here, I, I suppose, through Father Coughlin. And uh, Joseph Kennedy had a, a, a strong kind of Irish uh, ethnic identity. And uh, in a preconciliar church at a time when America first has a, the vocabulary that allows you to articulate criticism of the Jews, uh, he was able to do that. Now, what happened is after that is World War II. And what happened after World War II is basically the conservatism now was brought in as the replacement for America first. And that was a man of, you could say, Joseph, Joe McCarthy. Jo the Kennedy family supported Joe McCarthy. There's no question about it. It was a Catholic. They supported his, uh, the, it, at this point in time, uh, Catholics and Jews were two ethnic groups and the Jews were, almost to a man communist, and the Catholics were almost to a man anti-communist. And if you want uh, a reference, contemporary reference, watch Oppenheimer, where the, the Nolan, the Christopher Nolan, goes out of his way to portray the Manhattan Project as a Jewish operation from start, start to finish. Those people, those scientists, the Jewish scientists who were brought to Los Alamos, given asylum by the United States of America from political persecution, immediately started sending secrets to the Soviet Union because that was where their allegiance lay and they, because of the Jewish revolutionary spirit, which is their identity. That's what forms their identity. So to get to, uh, how do we get to Robert Kennedy? Well, first we have to have, go to the son, Robert Kennedy Sr. Appointed attorney general by his brother. So what does he do? He goes after Jews. He goes after, there's the obscenity case uh, with Eros Magazine, a guy, a Jew by the name of Ginsburg. The Jews were involved in obscenity. It's illegal. This is a, a, a no-brainer that the attorney general is going to go after Jewish uh, obscenity. The Jews never forgave Robert Kennedy for doing that. Though would, years later, they were still talking about Ralph Ginsburg and Eros Magazine. He went after, so there's a, a guy in... Um, Notre Dame quarterback becomes sheriff of uh, uh, Newport, Kentucky, and decides to clean up uh, the uh, clean up Sin City, which is basically a Jewish operation. It's Mo Dalitz, it's the Jewish Navy, it's gambling, it's prostitution, and uh, they uh, they uh, lure him into a trap. They give him a Mickey Finn. Uh, something that could have killed the Notre Dame football team. He wakes up uh, half naked in a bed with a prostitute by the name of April Flowers with the cameras going off. Robert Kennedy at this point gets involved and they drive the Jews out of Newport, Kentucky. And Mo Dallas goes to Las Vegas, which is a Jewish operation. And eventually 1984, the ADL, to bring it around to the full circle here, gives Mo Dallas, the Jewish uh, mobster, uh, it's Torches of Freedom Award because he gave uh, a, a lot of money to the ADL. This is the world. This is the world of reality here. Robert Kennedy drove Mo Dallas out of town and the Jews are never going to forgive him. So then Robert Jr. comes along. Who killed my father? Who killed my uncle? Now, the problem is that uh, he's got personal problems. Spending 14 years of your life as a heroin addict is not a good idea because if nothing else, you're not, all you're thinking about is your next fix. And so as a result, there's a huge gap in Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s education, what he knows and what he's allowed to say. And so he has this sense of like, uh, yeah, Israel. Yeah, we support Israel, don't we? No thinking going on here. You know what I mean? And then uh, he comes out and says, he's at an after dinner. He shouldn't have been photographed. This is a private conversation. But anyway, he goes into this thing, which what he really knows well is vaccines. Okay. He's an expert on vaccines, not much else, but he knows that. And he says, oh, there's something groove in that little DNA that makes Jews, they don't get the disease. Well, it immediately blows up and he 
He's an anti-Semite. Everybody, the Jewish Wurlitzer starts playing the same tune. Uh, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy's an anti-Semite. He has he got hit by this. He's got blindsided. Okay, he didn't know what hit him. And so at this point, Rabbi Shmuley Botik shows up and says, I know Robert Kennedy. He's not an anti-Semite. And at that point, Robert Kennedy Jr. is so grateful, he rushes out, picks up an Israeli flag, and starts marching down Broadway, waving an Israeli flag. This is called good cop, bad cop. It's the oldest trick in the book, and Bobby Kennedy fell for it because of the... What am I trying to say here? There was a disruption in American life. He understands that completely. He understands that his uncle was that was a coup d'etat that allowed another group of people, namely the Jews, under Lyndon Johnson, who was the most pro-Jewish president in human history, was sleeping with a Jewish whore when the U.S. liberty was attacked. He took power and he brought those people in and they got brought into the FBI. And now we're in a situation where they have completely taken over the government. Uh, and Robert Kennedy is simply not sensitive and doesn't understand this. Robert Kennedy should be going after Merrick Garland. What we're seeing here is when you appoint a Jew as head law enforcement official, he will not enforce the law as it should be enforced. He will uh, let his friends, fellow Jews, off the hook, and he will go at people that he doesn't like, namely Catholics who are pro-life, because abortion is a Jewish sacrament. Where is Robert Kennedy on this? He's, he's missing in action. That's the problem. Okay, so I'd like to pull some of this back again. Um, between really identifying and having this out there in public consciousness now when we might have this window of opportunity, um, that the issue is the unique claim of the Catholic Church, it's supersessionist claim, and the enmity, and the direction of that enmity toward that claim, um, and how we can think about this window of opportunity and perhaps even get in and uh, discuss uh, the pernicious force on both left and right, which is Zionism. But Will, I want you to um, direct us here for a moment. Can you ask Dr. Jones another question, please? Certainly. Yeah, Dr. Jones, uh, go back to what I was asking previously about um, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, uh, Benedict XVI, and his approach to theology. It seems to follow this um, kind of dialectical two-step where the hermeneutic of continuity is simultaneous with the hermeneutic of rupture. Uh, when you're reading this Communio article, it's as though each sentence is the negation of the previous sentence. Every affirmation of the tradition is met with the, the problematization of it next. And um, it's this kind of dialogical uh, progression through opposites. Um, and you pointed to, and this is, I think, chapter, uh, is it... Uh, um, sorry, chapter eight in your upcoming book, um, The Holocaust Narrative, uh, Joseph Ratzinger and Dasu Yerjal, uh, Jar. Sorry, I probably butchered that pronunciation. But, um, uh, you know, you're looking at his German background and the legacy of World War II and the Holocaust and the Morgan style plan, um, how he was formed in this kind of... Um, uh, the remnants of the Weimar era, Weimar theology, this kind of um, uh, mixing pot of uh, Jewish reform and pseudo-Catholic theologies. Um, and through his mentor, um, Hans Urs von Balthasar, um, he received this kind of um, raising of the bastions, lowering of the church's triumphalist claims. Um, and then in, in chapter 11 in your book, it's titled Eli Wiesel, Wiesel and the Silence of the God of God Trope which is kind of this um, uh, uh, um, reading of the Weimar Gnostic theology um, from people that Ratzinger quotes in other speeches like Ernst Bloch, the Jewish messianist, Martin Buber, which is uh, the subject of a book that um, Hans Urs von Balthasar writes on Catholic Jewish dialogue that's pointed to as being one of the precedents for Nostra Aetate. And then also Hans Jonas. And Hans Jonas has this... Uh, uh, thesis called the concept of God after Auschwitz when he talks about like God's retraction and it's filtered through the the kind of messianic ideas of Lurianic Kabbalah and then um, uh, 
von Balthasar takes this up as the idea of the kenosis of the church as this kind of typological retraction um, in which the church has to go through its passion again and lower itself and enter into a re-enter the catacombs and enter into a giornamento to be able to make peace with the world. Uh, and again, lowering that trans tri uh, triumphalist image of itself. So if we um, follow that forward in this kind of uh, Kabbalistic messianism to today, um, there's a very prominent thesis that's actually coming from Peter Seewald, uh, who I, I understand is a former Marxist. Um, and this book by uh, the, the or, uh, Italian uh, philosopher Giorgio Agamben called The Mystery of Evil, that's kind of swept the traditional Catholic world a, a storm about how um, Benedict XVI's uh, resignation was actually a kind of uh, cataconic, cata cataconic act and where he functioned as the restrainer who releases the mystery of iniquity with his resignation so that the church can enter into its passion and enter into the oh, state of emergency. Um, and then if you read Giorgio Agamben's other works, he's quoting directly from uh, Gershom Sholem and promoting Sabbatai and Sabatia uh, Zevi's uh, messianic ideas. So um, this kind of brings us to this little expose we want, we're hoping to do on a on a character named Joshua Charles, who's a you know a former speechwriter for Mike Pence and uh, has written for the Times of Israel, Jerusalem Post. Um, he's friends with Dennis Prager, and uh, now he's fashioning himself as a, a traditional Catholic eschatologist. Um, so anyway. Um, yeah, do you have any thoughts about that? Or Yeah, I I do have thoughts about that because uh this is this is preposterous. I mean, first of all, what about Peter Zavald? What about Peter Zavald? What he he interviews uh Ratzinger uh one of the interviews he did and he says to uh Ratzinger, "What about your great uncle?" <laughs> Ratzinger says, "Yeah, he was a character." Next question. Well, wait, stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you serious about this interview or not? Your great uncle was Georg Ratzinger. Georg Ratzinger wrote a book called Judicious Erwerbsleben. Okay, Jewish business practices. And if you look him up, he wrote it under a pseudonym, but everybody knows, Ali, that he wrote it. And everybody is calling your great uncle an anti-Semite. So was your great uncle an anti-Semite? Yes or no? That's the question that Zavald should have asked if he were a, 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 a real reporter. And instead, he's coming up with this cycle, this Jewish mumbo jumbo about, uh, you know, the final days and leading. I, I, this is crazy. There's one thing in, in his book. The by and when he goes and deals with the uh, the resignation, deals with the Williamson affair and then deals with the resignation, he quotes uh, Der Spiegel, which is in generally a wretched socialist magazine that got a license from the Jew to pro pro promote their ideas. But the Spiegel said that when Ratzinger resigned, it was Fahnenflucht, Fahnenflucht, which means desertion under fire. And the Spiegel was right. That's what it was. It was Fahnenflucht. And his cowardice, his inability to suffer for the church. The first time I met Ratzinger, he gave a speech in which he said, the church needs people who are willing to suffer for the truth. Well, how about you, uh, your holiness? Were you willing to suffer for the truth? Were you willing to fit, uh, stay to the end? Uh, and instead, what did you, he said, again, this is Zavod. I'm quoting Zavod here. Uh, when uh, Benedict, when Bratzinger became Pope, his first prayer was, pray that I do not flee when the wolves come. That's in Zaval's biography. Then Zaval goes and talks about what it was like in the Vatican after he resigned, and he said the the people of the Vatican, the, uh, the prelates, the people at the Vatican were walking around like sheep without a shepherd. Well, you put, you know, you put two and two, but you're not going to add it up to, to have four. And then you quote uh, Spiegel saying it's fun and fluke. That's what it was. That's what it was. This was a man. I mean, the verdict of history, I think, is in now. He will. We will never be able to change what he did. And what he did was basically unleash Francis on the church. 
And what does that mean? It means he unleashed the Jesuits from New York City as the people who are running the Catholic Church now. The editorial board of America Magazine is now running the church. And then he comes up with these preposterous press conferences on airplanes. It's like reminds me of the story of the Vatican where they said the the uh, Swiss guards are now going to be armed with tranquilizer guns. Because what they're going to do now is as soon as the Pope gets, they're going to shoot the Pope as soon as he gets on an airplane. So here is this uh, press conference he gives in which he says conservatives are afraid of blah, blah, blah. Uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know anything about America. What's happening here is that the Jesuits were on the wrong side of the culture wars ever since the 1960s. And if you want to go back to the beginning, read my book, John Cardinal Crow and the Cultural Revolution, based on archival material from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And at a certain point, neither Ball nor Crow, Ball, Bill Ball, the lawyer for the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference, would share any information with the Jesuits because it would invariably end up into in the dossier of Leo Pfeffer, the Jew who was the opponent on the other side. The Jew, the the, the Jesuits had sold out to America at that time. And the reward was that basically Georgetown became a feeder school for the State Department. And they've been in the pocket of the Americanists ever since. Now, this is the guy that the Pope is siding with against the people who tried to hold the line. I'm not saying they didn't make mistakes, but they were people who sincerely tried to hold the line on contraception, abortion, and all of the sexual issues, and now the Pope is demonizing them. This is the legacy of Joseph Ratzinger. He opened that door. Time magazine called him the first American Pope, and I think this is why they understood that. Time magazine has always been the propaganda ministry for the CIA, so they know whereof they speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, if somebody wants to get dazzled like the traditional influencer world seems to be by prophecies, um, if they want to do typology 101, it's not, not very difficult that in order to receive the, if the world is being prepared for a Mashiach, that they would have to aim to erode the claim of supersessionism. Being it's an ontological reality, they aim to to erode it in the minds of people. That's why I think it's so important to keep it front and center that we have to identify the enmity is the aim of the destruction of Western civilization, in particular, the Holy Catholic Church, in particular, the Eucharist. And um, Will, do you have a follow-up question to your last one? Because um, the author that he refers to there, he's dazzled almost the entire community overnight um, with this person that is the PR person for the neocon, Mike Pence. That seems to be the foot in the door for him. And he sort of repeats interview after interview, this kind of same thing, talking about Monsieur Dillon and Freemasonry, Freemasonry, Freemasonry. And now he's positioned as a typological um, expert. And he's got He's got some associations with people as crazy as you might not even be familiar with this character, Jonathan Connor, con man over in the Protestant world and dazzles people, you know, with this, okay, the Jewish Zionist rah, rah, rah. But um, unless we can really understand that the target of this movement, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent is in our minds this claim that Christ alone is the singular path to the Father, that, that nothing else matters. We have to be able to preserve this. And if the preservers, the traditionalists, hang off kilter because they're dazzled with ideas of Freemasonry, and I know you've discussed in the past, Freemasonry is dead. No, I mean, um, if you want, you want to, you want to read uh, my take on Freemasonry. Read the Jewish revolutionary spirit, and the 18th century in Europe was the age of Freemasonry. It was the cutting edge of revolution at that time. But what you're seeing here, to get back to the the crucial document that I we started off talking about at the beginning, where they talk about the Jewish people. That's not. The, that's that's a Zionist translation taken from Protestant Bibles when the Protestants were really affected by Zionism. I'm talking about mainstream 
You know, this is like 1948 when the state of Israel has been founded and all these people feel horrible about what they're calling the Holocaust. And we need their, they need our sympathy and they're poor, persecuted people. And so they change the sleight of hand, changing Israelites, which is in the Latin uh, Vulgate, uh, change it to the Jewish people. Well, as soon as you say that, hey, I guess Jonathan Greenblatt is uh, part of this uh, this uh, 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 operation. He everything that uh, that uh, Saint Paul said about the Israelites must apply to Jonathan Greenblatt because we're not talking about Israelites anymore. We're talking about the Jewish people. This is the type of underhandedness that was baked in to the USCC during this period of time and the mendacity that they have been using, and I'm sure it's it's influencing this guy who's putting the words into Mike Pence's mouth. Will, would you like to comment? Sure, yes. Um, and just to speak on, tap on what you're saying about the enmity here, Doug. Um, uh, you know, we don't have the, you know, when we have uh, our Lord calling out the, the synagogue as you brood of vipers. And then we have um, that as a reference to the, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And then, um, you know, we have the synagogue of Satan that reappears in, in the book of the apocalypse. And yet we have this whole industry of um, online traditional Catholic influencers who are there to be the restrainers of the, the tradition and um, uh, the, the, the permanent teachings of the church. They are now um, in this, position where they're obscuring um, the source of entity. And, you know, if you look at from Father Dennis Fahey um, to all the uh, 19th century uh, uh, church scholars on the issue of Freemasonry, including yourself, they're all, they're all pointing to um, the synagogue, um, Zionism, and uh, the, the Jewish revolutionary spirit as the source of uh, the Masonic upheaval in, in, in Europe and America. So um, it, it seems like um, this this person that we're talking about has been sewn in as leaven um, to introduce uh, these things that have already taken the Protestant eschatological world by storm. We think of him kind of as like a um, a Catholic version of um, Hal Lindsey or um, oh, what's the other? Right, uh, yeah, that's, what's the that's other right. that we talk about? Yeah, uh, yeah it, it, are swallowing it up. Yeah, it's complete, there, completely it alien, completely alien to Catholic theology. And the, yes. if, if you want the, the the straight story, it's in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. There's yes. nothing there's nothing mysterious about this. You know, they they were hiding in fear out of fear of the Jews. Now they have the Holy Spirit with them. Peter comes to Jerusalem and he opens the opening line is you killed Christ. Well, how's that for yes. an opening line? And uh, it's the best opening line he could have made because then you they say the Jews were cut to the heart. Well, if you're not going to open, say you did something wrong, why should the Jew feel uh, cut to the heart? And as soon as they're cut to the heart, they say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, you must be baptized. That's it. And I said yeah. this before, any pope who goes to Jerusalem, as Ratzinger did, and doesn't say that is not preaching the gospel. Yes, yeah, and Ratzinger exactly. goes to Jerusalem and he says, well, we've had 10 years of Catholic Jewish dialogue and we talked here and we talked there. Well, wait a minute. No, that's the gospel. You're not preaching the gospel. Same yeah. thing. Same thing is true of Ben Shapiro when he's talking to Bishop Barron. Ben Shapiro, yeah. the kind of cocky Jew who is on top of the world, says, so am I going to hell? Am I going to hell, Bishop? And instead, of, the answer should have been Ben are you baptized? Baptism, baptism, <laughs> baptism is necessary for salvation. Now yeah. we can make exceptions for you know the Yanomamo in the year six hundred BC who could not know about Jesus Christ, but you obviously know who Jesus Christ is, and if you refuse to be baptized, you cannot be saved. That's the message. That's it. There is nothing it's not salvific. It's not racial. It's there, is, there is nothing salvific about being a member of the ADL. There is no connection between the ADL and the Hebrew people, except what they fashion as their own propaganda device. 
There's no connection there. That connection, that that Hebrew people and the covenant they had ended when Jesus Christ was crucified. That's it. They, there is no curse on the Jewish people. The Jewish people can be saved, as Peter made perfectly clear when he spoke to the Jews in Jerusalem, but the condition is you have to be baptized. Yes. So when we began this, we said we were going to speak about the affairs of the world and the affairs of the church and the theology that both unites and divides that. And that is the claim of Christ, that no man gets to the Father but through me and the claim of the Catholic Church that entry into this is baptism. And that simple thing that there is one way and only one way and the law of non-contradiction applies, we have a world of Catholics generally that are scared to say this 101, a, a child should be able to have a straight reading of this, um, at least through the catechism and understand that is what we have to hold to. It's pretty simple, but yet people are getting dazzled by everything else in the, under the sun and forgetting about this, that it's that and, simple. And I'd just like to add as clarification that the bishops of the United States did affirm Catholic teaching. They did demand that that statement that the Mosaic Covenant be uh, is eternally valid be removed from the catechism, and they were subverted by their own bureaucracy. That's the story that needs to be told here. Now, oh, they, yeah. now they may be derelict in terms of delegating responsibility to people who should not be exercising that responsibility, but they did affirm the traditional teaching. Yeah, excellent. Well, um, I think we could I think we can pull it full circle. I really appreciate having you on there and your insights, Dr. Jones. I think you're a most important voice in the world today. And if we if if we're truly seeing a window of opportunity um, that people can re-examine your central claims that you have made and continue to make, would any of the other um, Boyd or Will, any kind of final comment that you would like to finish with? Do you have anything you want to say, Boyd? No, uh, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for being on. It was uh, really good to hear your insights. Well, yeah. thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. This is Logos Rising. This is the conversation that has to take place. And uh, what we believe is that the truth is great and that it will prevail no matter how much money the ADL has, okay? They believe the truth is the opinion of the powerful. We're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most powerful people in the world, but uh, we believe in the truth, and the, Jesus Christ said he was the way, the truth, and the light, and yeah. we are going to prevail. Well, you've been graced with this thick skin, and I think people have to understand that um, if with any kind of movement, and we have to stand for the truth. Will, any final comments? I just want to thank you, Dr. Jones, for sharing this time with us. And uh, I really value your comments. I look forward to re-listening to this. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to conclude, everybody. Thank you, everybody um, out there. This has been Dr. Deep State, and I hope everybody is doing well. Thank you very much. <laughs>